Okay, we're inside the uh, the back end of the solar system inside the shed. Uh, this conduit uh, you can see in front of you, that's your uh, DC um, voltage feed off your solar panels outside. Configured in such a way that it's uh, 48 volts. If we just follow the conduit down. <coughs> the uh, one here, let's just see if I can get that. That one there, that's your 48 feet volt feed from your solar panels. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this system has quite a few safety features built into it and um, what it has, let's see if I can focus this okay what you've got there is two circuit breakers now effectively what that does is if um, if the need requires or that something happens let's see if I can get a bit of light on that um, they're the two circuit breakers that isolate the output of your solar panels from the rest of the system in here uh, in fact, in later systems, even the uh, grid-fed systems, uh, this is a safety requirement. Um, so that uh, even if the rest of the system is disconnected, those solar panels are still putting out um, quite a bit of uh, voltage and um, quite a bit of uh, DC amperage. All right. From there goes up into this box and uh, this is the uh, virtually the black box of the system the uh, DC voltage from the solar panels go in there uh, it's got a monitor panel, a little red button there so you can monitor what's coming off the solar panel, you can also monitor uh, the power consumption coming off the battery system which I'll show you soon um, and it also uh, monitors, I believe, if I remember correctly, I had to have a look through the specs. Uh, it can monitor the uh, power consumption within the house. So that's that's basically uh, pretty much the heart of the system. Um, that's where all the action happens. So from the solar panel isolation switches um, representing each separate array outside you've got the DC feed coming through another safety feature here step back a bit get some light on that um, it's, it's a fuse system down to the battery bank uh, but also um, it has this handle on top which is uh, a breaker uh, reset breaker type thing so if you get a problem in your battery bank um, then it automatically um, activates that and um, doesn't do any more damage to the system, that's the theory behind it. Alright, we'll follow these uh, cable feeds down, remember this is still 48 volt DC, uh, then we come down to the battery banks. Now, these battery banks, um, considering this system is 6 years old, uh, they're actually two volt lead acid deep cycle cells according to the spec book and each battery, each cell is arranged in series so we've got um, one, two, three, four, three is a twelve so the whole battery system is wired up in series uh, to give you a 48 volt uh, DC input to your inverter. Now these do require maintenance uh, as John was saying before um, if we have a look here let me get a good picture of it that orange cap there that gives you an indicator of um, the level of electrolyte in the um, individual 2, two volt um, batteries so about once a month uh, he's got to top a few up so um, that's all part and parcel of the maintenance now the last time I checked I don't, I don't know if it was this particular brand of 2 volt uh, battery but you're looking up uh, 
the ones I checked anyway were up around about um, three three hundred dollars each or a little bit more uh, so uh, no doubt uh, these batches have been in here for about six years so you can imagine that uh, they would have cost a fair bit some time ago alright so you've got the DC feed in there coming back going into the batteries but this is where all the action happens there's no separate leads coming back off those batteries into your inverter box here this is what I as I said before the heart of the system so there's some sort of um, um, system in there I haven't got a circuit diagram for it schematics for it but what comes out of there is um, 48 volts DC down to another uh, circuit breaker for the two feeds that go into the inverter so at this point here the switches the switch the switch here can isolate um, the inverter from the rest of the system just by switching it off or if they happen to trip for some particular reason so then we go on to the inverter now this is a 3.5 uh, kilowatt pure sine wave inverter let's see if I get a bit the light's not very good in here at the moment that's it there it's got monitoring um, LED uh, lights on there to tell you the state of the system what's happening with it and also a reset uh, breaker here so that uh, if for some reason the inverter is overloaded uh, by an appliance uh, or as John said sometimes um, you might use electrical equipment or try to use electrical equipment in the um, garage um, it's an automatic shut off so you don't uh, cook the, the inverter out of the top of the inverter which is now what I'm looking at in front of you there that's 240 volts AC uh, here in Australia that's the mains voltage for, for most residences and what they call the um, sub uh, switch box um, in this case the way it's been configured this is the main one and then there's another sub box on on the house itself so going from left to right uh, the black switch is the main switch you throw that off and it just cuts power to the house altogether the one in the middle of the orange and the it's gang to the white switch uh, that's for power points inside the house for appliances and the other one is um, sub main for the house that's I would say a separate isolation switch again uh, to isolate the um, house from the shed and of course you've got a uh, power point there if you need to um, uh, use any 240 volt appliances so without getting too much into technicalities of it I just went through with John trying to work out how the system is put together uh, bearing in mind it was put together six years ago um, so battery bank in terms of costs uh, John said the battery bank costs just by itself uh, $10,000 so with the front end of the uh, solar array you're talking at $20,000 so far and all the rest of this up here including a charging unit to run off a generator which I'll cover in a minute that was another $10,000 and bearing in mind this was ten year, um, six years ago so all up for a 3.5 kilowatt um, off the grid 240 volt or, or uh, off grid uh, main uh, supply from solar systems for a system like this um, 3.5 kilowatts you're looking at or well, back in those days three years uh, six years ago thirty thousand dollars and that includes this uh, particular charging box here now as you remember I may remember I said solar systems are good when the sun is shining on cloudy days or rainy days uh, that's when you run into problems with them because they're not operating at maximum efficiency 
uh, your battery bank will only store so much power night and day and of course the charge and those will eventually run down when um, the uh, solar system is not operating at its maximum efficiency during daylight hours and of course at night it doesn't work at all so we'll talk about backup systems okay this cabinet here is um, pretty big it's probably modern technology in its day but it's an alternate uh, charging system should the uh, batteries run down on cloudy rainy days we've been having for the last well in this area for the last couple of weeks uh, where you can hook in uh, an alternative uh, supply and what that does is um, in this particular situation I'll just back out a bit you can see the power cord there uh, what John uses is a backup generator uh, this one's rated at about 7 kVA uh, electric start uh, unleaded gasoline and um, I was just talking to him uh, before we started this video and he's had to use this generator over the last couple of days simply because of the weather conditions where the um, solar system has to be operating at maximum capacity or efficiency so that's one of the things you've got to consider with off-grid solar systems um, they're very vulnerable to weather conditions and um, you've got to be very aware of the power consumption of these systems you've only got limited power and if it's a prolonged period uh, like two or three days or four days I've, like it has been over the last uh, well we've had rain and cloudy weather here for the best part of two weeks uh, you've got to have some sort of backup system to keep these batteries charged up or uh, in some cases uh, people have the um, either the uh, power distribution board or the sub board in the house uh, professionally wired up to uh, plug a generator straight into it so you can go either, either two ways on that and just completely bypass the, uh, the solar system if you want to so that's pretty well it folks uh, that's the solar system on uh, this homestead it's completely off grid as I said in previous videos um, solar systems and the razzle dazzle about them yes they're good they're good when they're working efficiently when you've got good sunlight but you've got to be aware of the downfalls of them when they're not working efficiently during um, weather uh, conditions certainly seasonal conditions you get less sunlight uh, hours during the winter here or any other part of the world and you've got to have some sort of backup charging system to top those batteries up You've also got to be aware too that if, um, the maintenance on these systems it's not just a matter of installing walk away and forget them um, in this case here the lead acid batteries have to be checked for electrolyte levels in them topped up um, checking the um, specific gravity of the um, electrolyte inside to see uh, what condition the batteries are in and also with the solar panels outside um, as I mentioned before, I think one of the earlier videos, they've got to be kept clean. Out here in the bush, yeah, we get a lot of dust. Um, times of uh, bushfires or smoke around, you get a lot of fallout from uh, bushfire smoke. And, uh, and indeed, during uh, very wet conditions, uh, as has happened at my place uh, about two years ago, um, you can get a mold or fungus growing on on the solar panel so you've got to keep them clean and spotless in snow areas that's a whole different story um, so uh, I'm not too familiar with that because we don't normally get snow here but um, <clears throat> there are certainly ways around that so that pretty well wraps it up for this series folks there'll be a summary after that so uh, no doubt solar technology the price of it uh, compared to six years ago has come down somewhat but again it depends what capacity you're looking at you need for an off-grid homestead and again as I mentioned before it's a change in lifestyle you've got to conserve every bit of energy you use off these systems and have some sort of backup system to um, to uh, charge the batteries whether it's a generator or wind turbine or whatever the case may be whatever suited for your area or, or for your needs so um, that's pretty weird. that's the basics of it without getting too much into the technology 
um, that conduit you can see on the wall there I'll just show you just to confirm it that's the power feed that goes off to the uh, the house the power feed is actually buried underground and comes up on a subboard on the house so uh, that's where it is there all right folks that wraps it up so um, that'll give you some idea about off-grid uh, solar powered systems they're good when they're working you've got to have contingency sand plans for backup and you've got to maintain them so uh, it's something you really got to think about power consumption and how much supply you need and the maintenance of it all right folks thanks for watching